small eyesore and had been overlooked, and I had a view of the water, a partial view of my neighbor's lawn, and the consoling proximity of millionaires, all for eighty dollars a month. Across the courtesy bay, the white palaces of fashionable East End glittered along the water, and the history of the summer really begins on the evening I drove over there to have dinner with the Don Buchanans. Daisy was my second cousin once removed, and I'd known Tom in college, and just after the war, I spent two days with them in Chicago. Her husband, among various physical accomplishments, had been one of the most powerful ends that ever played football at New Haven. A national figure in a way. One of those men who reached such an acute limited excellence at 21 that everything afterwards savors of anticlimax. His family were enormously wealthy. Even in college, his freedom with money was a matter of reproach. But now he left Chicago and come east in a fashion that rather took your breath away. For instance, he brought down a string of polo ponies from Lake Forest. It was hard to realize that a man in my own generation was wealthy enough to do that. Why they came east, I don't know. But they had spent a year in France for no particular reason, and then drifted here and there unrestfully wherever people played polo and were rich together. This was a permanent move, said Daisy over the telephone. But I didn't believe it. I had no sight to Daisy's heart, but I felt that Tom would drift on forever seeking, a little wistfully, for the dramatic turbulence of some irrecoverable football game. And so it happened that on a warm windy evening, I drove over to East Egg to see two friends whom I scarcely knew at all. Their house was even more elaborate than I expected. A cheerful red and white Georgian colonial mansion overlooking the bay. The lawn started at the beach and ran towards the front door for a quarter of a mile, jumping over sundials and brick walks and burning gardens. Finally, when it reached the house, drifting up the side in bright vines as though from the momentum of its run, the front was broken by a line of French windows glowing now with reflected gold and white open to the warm windy afternoon. And Tom Buchanan in riding clothes was standing with his legs apart in the front porch. He had changed since his New Haven years. Now he was a sturdy, straw-haired man of thirty with a rather hard mouth and a superfluous manner. Two shiny American eyes had established dominance over his face and gave him the appearance of always leaning aggressively forward. Not even the effeminate swank of his riding clothes could hide the enormous power of that body. He seemed to fill those glistening boots until he strained the top lacing, and you could see a great pack of muscle shifting when his shoulder moved under his thin coat. It was a body capable of enormous leverage, a cruel body. His speaking voice, a gruff husky tenor, added to the impression of that he approved of me and wanted 
saw that turbulent emotions possessed her, so I asked what I thought would be some sedative questions about our little girl. We don't know each other very well, Nick, she said suddenly. Even if we are cousins, you didn't come to my wedding. I wasn't back from the war. That's true, she hesitated. Well, I've had a very bad time, Nick, and I'm pretty cynical about everything. Evidently, she had a reason to be. I waited, but she didn't say any more, and after a moment, I returned rather feebly to the subject of her daughter. I suppose she talks and eats and everything. Oh, yes, she looked at me absently. Listen, Nick, let me tell you what I said when she was born. Would you like to hear? Very much. It'll show you how I got to feel about things. Well, she was less than an hour old, and Tom was God knows where. I woke up out of the ether with an utterly abandoned feeling, and asked the nurse right away if it was a boy or a girl. She told me it was a girl. And so I turned my head away and wept. All right, I said. I'm glad it's a girl, and I hope she'll be a fool. That's the best thing a girl could be in this world. A beautiful little fool. You see, I think everything's terrible anyhow, she went on in a convinced way. Everybody thinks so. The most advanced people. And I know. I've been everywhere and seen everything and done everything. Her eyes flashed around her. She laughed with a thrilling scorn. Sophisticated. God, I'm sophisticated. The instant her bro voice broke off, ceasing to compel my attention, my belief, I felt the basic insincerity. I felt the basic insincerity of what she had said. It made me feel uneasy, as though the whole evening had been a trick of some sort to exact a contributory emotion from me. I waited, and sure enough, in a moment she looked at me with an absolute smirk on her lovely face, as if she had inserted her membership in a rather distinguished secret society to which she and Tom belonged. Inside, the crimson room bloomed with light. Tom and Miss Baker sat at either end of the long couch, and she read aloud to him from the Saturday Evening Post. The words, murmurous and 
peace and love.